Greetings from Williamstown. On behalf of all of us here at the college, it's my honor to welcome you to today's event spotlighting the Davis Center, its vital work and the staff, faculty and students who contribute to successful execution of its mission. The Davis Center seeks to ensure that all students can thrive and to foster a more inclusive environment benefiting the entire community by advancing broad campus engagement with complex issues of identity, history, and cultures as they affect intellectual, creative, and social life. The composition of Williams has changed dramatically over the past half century, but the heart of it has not. We still serve high achieving, intellectually curious, ambitious students who want to leave the world in Williams better than they found it. We've been creating and evaluating programs to meet student needs for generations. And through the Davis Center Initiative, we will expand our most successful programs and build out new ones to meet the needs of today's students. We take pride in welcoming high achieving students whose diverse backgrounds allow for truly dynamic discussion and debate in the classroom and the dorm room. Our current student body speaks 71 languages, has 46, 46 different religious traditions, includes students from all gender identities and sexual orientations, and nearly 20% are first generation college students. From the founding vision of a center that quote, serves the unique social and cultural needs of students of color and international students, the dream has grown as Williams has become more diverse. Our vision for the Davis Center Initiative is a redoubling of our investments in the people, programs, and place that comprise the center and to ensure Williams is the diverse, equitable, and inclusive college we aspire for it to be. We will retain the aspects that are most meaningful, of course, while expanding capacity and updating physical space in order to fulfill the mission of advancing broad campus engagement with complex issues of identity, history, and cultures as they affect intellectual, creative, and social life. So to get us started, I'd like to introduce the wonderful panelists who have joined me here today. And we're gonna spend the next hour in conversation with them and then take your questions later in the program. Let me begin by introducing them. First, we have with us Letitia Smith Evan Haynes, Williams class of 1999, who's the Vice President for Institutional Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at Williams College. She's a member of the college's senior staff and in her role, she serves as the institution's primary strategist, working to ensure the Williams community is diverse, equitable, and inclusive. She brings more than two decades of experience as an administrator, educator, civil rights advocate, and lawyer. Letitia provides leadership for the Office of Institutional Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, which includes the Davis Center and the Office of Special Academic Programs and committees and initiatives focused on matters of diversity, equity, and inclusion. With Letitia is Eden Renee Hayes, PhD, who is the director of the Davis Center. As director, she advances the Davis Center's vision of working towards a more inclusive college community, fostering positive inter and intragroup dialogue, integrating restorative approaches into our work, and advocating for racial and social justice. Immediately prior to coming to Williams, Hayes was Dean of Equity and Inclusion and Associate Professor of Psychology at Bard College at Simons Rock. Her research and expertise center on bias and the intersecting identities of race, class, and gender identity and expression. Also with us is Carmen Whalen, who's the Carl W. Vogt Professor of History, co-chair and professor of Latinx Studies and faculty fellow of the Davis Center and the Office of Institutional Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Her research and teaching is centered on Latinx histories, the Puerto Rican diaspora, comparative Latinx migrations, and Latinas in the global economy. Professor Whalen's books include From Puerto Rico to Philadelphia, Puerto Rican Workers and the Post-War Economies, and the Puerto Rican Diaspora Historical Perspectives. We also have with us today Mohammed Memphis, who is a senior from Atlanta, majoring in environmental studies and political science. While at Williams, he helped lead numerous student organizations. His interest areas are climate and environmental law and policy and voting rights, and he is hoping and planning to attend law school. Also with us is Dom Madera, a senior from Houston, majoring in comparative literature and English. 
A Roche Fellow and the Class of 1957 Summer, Summer Research Fellow, Dom has also served as Communications Director for the Minority Coalition, Minko, as Community Builder at the Davis Center and as Resident Mentor at the Summer Humanities and Social Science Programs. A few reminders for everyone joining us today. Please feel free to utilize the chat as a space to engage with the community. I see many of you are already doing that, which is great, and share any reflections or comments you may have. If you have questions, please utilize the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar at any time during today's talk. We'll have dedicated time for your questions at the towards the last third of the presentation, but you can submit your questions as you think of them so that we don't lose sight of them as we move forward. Now I'm gonna to turn to questions for the panel. Um, and I think um, as we get started, I would like to direct the first question um, to Leticia, although we do hope to open up the panel for a broad discussion as we're moving forward. Uh, but uh, Leticia, I'd like to start off by having you perhaps um, share some of the de wonderful DEI work that's been going on in the college. And I'm particularly interested in the question of uh, how the current environment around the racial justice work um, and uh, some of the events of the summer uh, has infiltrated the way you think about the work that you're doing um, and the programs as we go forward. So uh, Leticia, maybe you could take that one. Absolutely, and I, I will probably just speak high level and let everyone else jump into the weeds because everyone on this panel has been involved and you Maud, have also been involved in this work. So I wanna thank Maud. Um, first for her commitment to this work and being bold and upfront about it and helping the institution move forward uh, for having us invest along with the Board of Trustees in a building project um, that will help serve this work. So let me just start by saying that the work of the Davis Center and more broadly, the Office of Institutional Diversity, Equity, Inclusion is necessary, necessarily nimble. In terms of place and space, the beauty of the work is that it's carried out both on campus and beyond. So we work with not only students, faculty, staff who are here, but also alums in the broader community in Berkshire County and beyond. We aim to engage and support the community in a variety of ways, but as Maud mentions racial justice, the thing that I'm reminded of is that the type and the manner of engagement often depend on the needs that we have at any given time both again, the needs that are on campus and also the experiences of our collective communities off campus. With regard to one of the most recent waves of racial violence against black and other people of color, uh, both at the hands of law enforcement and in light of COVID-19, um, the Davis Center was in the trenches leading conversations, developing critical programming so that we're we were engaging with advocates and communities across the country. And then afterwards, we were really, not even afterwards, because there are things that are still happening today, but we've really helped lead and facilitate the college's response by supporting and encouraging participatory engagement with racial justice and social justice organizations in a way that we hadn't done so in the past. And also by supporting research by students in particular and partnerships that students might develop with organizations, with faculty members on and off campus. So I just want to want to step back a minute and say that when I think about what the college um, is committed to, liberal arts, access, diversity, equity, inclusion, it seems that we're best positioned to fully embrace those things if we position everyone here, students, pre-frosh, staff, tenured faculty members, and those in the broader communities, alums and people of Williamstown, Berkshire County and beyond, as lifelong learners. So we aim to support a campus that's reflective and restorative, that is essential to sharing experiences and learning with each other so that we're allowed to engage in deep restorative um, reflection when necessary. And that is the work of the Davis Center. That is the work that it has become. Um, it is work that we do every day. We listen through, we use education to help build and sustain a diverse, equitable, inclusive environments where we all live, learn and work. And we recognize that although we're all individuals, we collectively make up this broader Williams community and deem that it's imperative that all members of our community have a strong sense of belonging regardless of their identities. So and I'm just gonna say this before Maude cuts me off. In a nutshell, we, we really, okay. We that was a mistake, really, just ignore okay, that. <laughs> that the Davis Center and the office more broadly, we, we open doors, we create and bolster pathways to and through the academy. We embrace the diverse members of our community 
and we're diligent about reaching out to and supporting the members of our community who are from groups historically oppressed, excluded, or oftentimes marginalized in our society. And we all know, I th including everyone on this call, that there are many. So we're talking about people of color, we're talking about women, we're talking about those who might not be citizens of the United States, um, those who have various religions and, and um, you name it, LG, those who are members of the LGBTQIA community. So that's all I'm gonna say for now and I'm gonna be quiet and let others jump into the weeds, but thank you for asking Maud. Thanks, Leticia. And sorry, I, I, I had tricky fingers there jumping at the uh, mute button. <laughs> I didn't mean no, to cut No, it's okay. Off. It's okay. We all love talking. So let me not take up the air time. <laughs> we do. Um, so maybe now I'll just turn to Eden Renee and ask, um, Eden, what are some of the, Eden Renee, what are some of the pressing needs that the Davis Center is addressing at this moment and how? I'm sure folks are curious uh, about current work and programs and also life in the pandemic and how we're supporting students uh, this year. Uh, yeah, um, the Davis Center is facing the like exactly what you brought up, um, COVID, um, which is exactly what everyone is faced with right now. This is what we did before. How do we do that pandemic style? So, like from that, uh, and we have definitely gone online for everything, just like everybody does, and as we are doing like, right at this particular moment. So we have online office hours that are hold um like by myself and Dominic too, um, because Dominic is one of our fabulous community engagement fellows. And, uh, and we have turned all of our educational workshops to, to be online. Some of them are actually available through the Davis Center website. So I highly recommend um, if you'd like to learn more about allyship or learn more about intergroup dynamics, we have asynchronous workshops available on the Davis Center website for you to learn more about um, you know, what what we do with everyone in the community um, and also just see more of our community engagement fellows at work. Um, and also it, it is a fair amount of helping with crisis support. Some students are in different places than others as it relates you know, to what's happening with COVID. So it's reaching out, what's going on? How are you, what do you need? Um, trying to help students soon to adjust to that. Um, we also have about 23 different um, minority coalition groups, um, which is fabulous and it is growing. Uh, I would not um, stop at 23 now because uh, I'm sure that by the end of the semester we'll have one or two more. Um, so how do we support them under COVID? And that's with helping them to figure out, okay, you want to have this, uh, this event this is how you can get food for the event if the people are on campus. This is how um, you know that works when you're working with this particular restaurant on Spring Street or that particular restaurant on Spring Street because each one has come up with different ideas as to how it is they're going to be able to work with the college under um, pandemic style. And so we've done a lot of helping everyone to figure out how is it that they could hold the events that they want to hold um, considering the fact that some of their um, their group members are like on campus <laughs> and some of their group members are all across the globe. So how do we ship everything to them? Like, how is it that we can, you know, provide care packages? How is it that we can, you know, really engage with everyone and find different things to do? And so I myself also started a tea with Dr. E just because I thought it sounded cute. Um, and it's just a way for me to connect with the Minko leaders and have an opportunity to see like what's going on, how you doing, what you binging on Netflix. Um, so we have an opportunity to really like engage with one another and talk. And, you know, I can say, well, uh, this is how you can do that thing that you're having problems with. And we can help each other to get over these different hurdles. Uh, we've had to change like, other programming online, all of our community engagement fellow training had to go online. And now our fellows are going to be this spring teaching the many different workshops, the educational workshops for all the different groups um, you know, on, online. So we had to do further training about, okay, this is how we're going to do this, considering the fact that we're not in person, how are we gonna engage everyone? How are we gonna do this activity? How are we gonna do that one? And so it's, it's a lot of trying to figure out how to support everyone, engage with them, considering the fact that we are, you know, in under a pandemic and uh, hopefully still able to connect with one another. Thank you so much. I know um, Eden Renee is new to the team this year and what a year to start uh, to join a residential liberal arts college um, entirely remotely. I don't think we've ever met in person actually, although we've met many, many times this way now. Um, and I know uh, that in some ways speaks to the moment uh, and uh, all the 
extra challenge of joining a community and leading it in this moment. I know you've been doing a, a terrific job. So thank you for, uh, for, for all the hard work you've been doing to support our community. Um, Carmen, I was wondering if you might talk a little bit about um, the critical work faculty is doing in the space of diversity, equity, inclusion, um, and um, anti-racist uh, work from your perch uh, as a faculty member and in the Davis Center and as at the head of, a, of an academic department. Sure. So in terms of the Davis Center, one of the main links to faculty is through the faculty fellows. And there are now two faculty fellows, um, one from divisions one and two, and one from STEM plus fields. And those faculty fellows serve as a resource for the Davis Center around faculty matters, how best to reach and support faculty, things that might be coming up for faculty, um, so ways for the Davis Center to reach out to faculty, but it's also a bridge for faculty um, and faculty use the faculty fellows as a resource um, for things that they're addressing in terms of trying to build an inclusive curriculum, um, trying to support students, uh, maybe um, increase equity, inclusion, diversity um, amongst their majors. Um, those are conversations that any faculty member can reach out to a faculty fellow to talk about. Um, the other thing that faculty reach out a lot for is some of them are actually working to really build pathways for their students from underrepresented and marginalized groups. Sometimes they want support to send students to a different conference or some other kind of event. This is a little pre-pandemic, so attend virtually right? Um, in our current moment. Um, but really trying to support pathways for students from historically underrepresented and often marginalized groups. Um, we also end up doing a lot of support for faculty from those same groups um, and often trying to serve as a safe space for them to come and talk about how to um, move through the academy, within the academy, um, and just, just to get a little bit of extra support as well. Um, so those are some of the ways. We're also hoping that our um, new, newly defined position um, for the Associate Director for Inclusive Learning Environments will be a new bridge to really foster and sustain those relationships with academic programs, with faculty, um, with academic staff, with others, um, as we try to make every single piece of Williams College an inclusive learning environment. We use le learning environment to include absolutely everything at a residential college. Um, and so we're really hoping that that new person will be able to come on board and help um, further strengthen um, those bridges um, with a student-centered approach um, to inclusive pedagogy, inclusive curriculum, and inclusive learning environments. Um, we're also starting a new initiative um, for pre-tenure faculty specifically who are working on questions of indigeneities, race, gender, and sexualities. And that is a, a sort of a, a space, we're trying to figure out how do you build connections during a pandemic and particularly for new incoming faculty. Um, we think that that's pretty challenging. Um, a lot of the work that the Davis Center has done historically is around food and gathering. So trying to figure out how to do all of that virtually is a challenge and it takes some creativity. So the hope is that this will be an initiative where faculty can both just connect um, at the most simple level, um, meet each other and connect, um, but also share work in progress, scholarship in progress. Um, there are lots of supports for teaching um, and you know, we won't be devoid of teaching, but we're also trying to create a little bit of space um, for scholars to figure out how to move their scholarship forward in pandemic times too, um, when lots of folks' research agendas have taken an incredible hit. Um, so we're trying to sort of just bolster at least the conversations, the thinking, the strategizing, um, and foster a sense that it's moving forward even in these challenging times. Um, so that's just a little bit of the work around faculty. I think faculty are engaged in some ways with all assets of the, of the Davis Center and support many, many of the activities and programming. Um, faculty fellows also are advisors for um, different Minko groups that even Renee mentioned, um, and so work closely with particular groups of students as well. I think I'm gonna stop there and, and, and let other folks go. Thanks. Um, I have a couple of questions for the students, which I'm going to turn to, but maybe just before that, one follow-up question for the three of you. you. You mentioned the phrase inclusive pedagogy, which I think for those of us who work in higher ed is a, is a phrase we throw around. And maybe everybody listening understands what we mean when we say that. But I was wondering if you could say a couple words about what that means to you. And also maybe um, Leticia and Eden Renee could jump in to just talk a little bit about 
you know, we throw these words around a lot, diversity, equity, and inclusion. What do we mean by creating an inclusive culture and how do we imagine some of these positions and programming working to do that? So I can just start by saying, I use both inclusive pedagogies and inclusive curriculum. And so an inclusive curriculum means that the curriculum is, it has had to historically expand between Anglo-American Eurocentric approaches to actually include the lived experiences of people of color, of queer folks, right? And so a lot of that work started with the initiation of interdisciplinary programs like Latinx studies, Africana studies, women, gender, sexuality studies. Um, but, and that is really, really important work. And I hope so because I've been really <laughs> involved in it, but it's also this issue of trying to get all of the curriculum to be inclusive. Right, um, and so that it isn't um, siloed, um, but it's woven through the entire curriculum, that kind of inclusive approach and perspective. And then the pedagogy refers more specifically to the ways that we teach can assume, for example, prior knowledges. Um, and I think sometimes the most, the easiest way to talk about this sometimes is to actually um, talk about being inclusive of first generation students. Right, Williams faculty historically have maybe assumed a student that came from a prep school environment that came from families and households that gave them a whole lot of social capital around how to negotiate and move through um, elite academic institutions right, what does it look like when you rethink your classroom. Um, to think about what it's like for a first gen student who maybe has not encountered all of that. Right, and I remember early on for me, one of the moments was, you know, a student said to me, why would a professor assume that I know what a syllabus is, right? And so just something that faculty just routinely took for granted, right? A student wanted to hit a pause button and say, why do you like, why, why do faculty always assume that this is part of, right? And so it's just this way of thinking about acknowledging that students come from different places and they have different experiences and they have different ways of learning. And so the pedagogy piece, inclusive pedagogy, is trying to just figure out how we acknowledge all of that in the classroom and in the ways that we teach so that we make sure that we're teaching to everyone so that everyone can thrive. And I'm gonna let Eden and Leticia hop in now. Yeah, uh, would Eden, Renee or Leticia, would you all like to take a stab at the question? Yeah, we can probably tag team it. I'll say one thing or two quick things, um, just to tag on to Carmen's piece, the, the inclusive learning environments at Williams, we think expands, as Carmen mentioned earlier, beyond. So whether you're talking about um, you're on the athletic field or whether you're on, you know, on the stage, whether you're in the dining hall, because at a Williams, I think you all would agree, every environment is a learning environment, even when you're having dinner with your peers or your professors. So that's why we have thought about it more broadly. With regard to the other part of Maud's question, I'll just use one example. So when we think about the equity piece, um, the Davis Center, our office more broadly, did facilitate conversations with faculty and academic staff and others about the equity pieces and inclus inclusion pieces, particularly in light of COVID. So just thinking about where people are as they're trying to study remotely. This was particularly true after we all, everyone went home, all students went home in March, um, save for the ones who didn't have a place that they, they could go. And there were some real um, disparities with regard to what faculty in particular were noticing around how student, how they were able to engage. So for example, there was a professor who teaches dance and, and she said, you know, among all sorts of faculty, those from the, the sciences and the like, um, there were students who didn't have a place to move they, and they couldn't go outside and move. Um, so there was just no, how, how can you include them in the classroom and how can you, how can the college create an environment that is equitable for all students so that everyone is kind of on equal footing, if you will, as they were proceeding. So that's just one example. And we, we provided a forum so that we could people could brainstorm and think about ways to address these things because they were really at the fore of everyone's minds. And that was something that was wonderful to see. Um, so I just, I'll say that and then turn it over to Eden Renee. I don't know if you wanna jump in and tag team this. 
I can. Um, and thanks everyone for giving me a chance for my cat to decide whether or not I was an appropriate couch at this particular moment. Um, but I, no, I would also just add that I, inclusive pedagogy means like thinking about, okay, um, who do we have around us? Who's in this classroom? And also like, who is it that is not in this classroom? And thinking about that, you know, as I, Maude pointed out, I was a, you know, a tenure professor before starting this particular position. And like we saw a, a great groundswell of more knowledge having to do with trans and non-binary communities. So I had to think, okay, how is it that I can incorporate that into my classes, into my syllabus, uh, and think about what does that mean in terms of treatment of the students in the classroom? What does that mean in terms of like, what is it that I'm going to put, you know, within my syllabus? So like with that, it's, it's taking those bits and making sure that they're not just um, like siloed on the syllabus just for the one day and that they're integrated throughout and that you're also sharing out to your, your professor peers um, and staff peers to say, hey, um, you know, I learned this. Uh, uh, what else can we do around around this? Let's 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 continue with these discussions to figure out how we can do our best to serve our communities and make sure that they're centered when we know that over time they have been like more and more marginalized. Thank you. Um, I'd love to turn now to the two student panelists uh, who are with us today um, to hear uh, a little bit about how they've interacted with the Davis Center. Um, over their four years, both are seniors, so we'll, we can get the, the pandemic year, but also um, the period before and hopefully after uh, as we return to um, life a little more the way we know it here. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you've engaged the Davis Center and what you and other students are most excited by uh, through the work that is happening uh, in the center. And maybe um, Dom will turn to you first. Sure, so I mean, uh, so I, with the exception of the year that I was abroad, I've worked at the Davis Center my entire Williams career. Um, and in that time, I've worn many hats, um, but I think that a way to kind of move through my Davis Center journey is to talk about the current uh, work that I'm doing uh, with my individual projects. So, so as a CEF, I do presentations and try to guide people through uh, different complex aspects of identity. I do individual projects and the occasional committee work. Um, but my individual project for this semester and, and something that I'm really excited about is I'm working with um, Bilal Ansari on a project about the archives in Williamstown that kind of addresses um, the persistent and continued presence of minoritized people in Williamstown from queer people to uh, black residents of White Hill to indigenous people. Um, and that's been really meaningful work because it means that I pour over newspaper clippings, testimonials, church records, and look at the continued presence of people who have historically been erased um, in, our, in our history, both institutionally and, and otherwise. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of people are excited about at this moment is that we're re re renewing uh, a look at our history and trying to examine uh, the way some people have been left out, even though they've continuously um, been present. Um, and, and I think that is tied into, you know, a, a, someone asked in the Q&A, you know, how we engage with the community, which is particularly difficult during COVID, but I think that doing work in the archives, uh, we're using Chapin Archives in particular, um, is one way that we can look at our community historically and say, okay, this is the, the history that we haven't really examined or looked at or addressed. Um, and how do we think about our present in a different way from that history? Um, so that's also tied in with some of the committee work that I'm doing uh, on the new Davis Center building, which I won't talk about too explicitly, but um, you know, we are looking at the history of indigenous people and black people and minoritized people at large in Williamstown and trying to incorporate, incorporate that into the architecture of the building, into the layout of the space um, and into the kind of cultural ethos of the Davis Center going forward. Um, and I think, you know, doing that kind of work also informs the way I do presentations, which has changed over time. I think, you know, um, I started really confidently <laughs> as people do as first years. And as I've moved through uh, each year at Williams, I've started to, you know, pause, take a beat and think about the, the words that I'm saying in each presentation. So for instance, I often give the presentation to uh, wolf leaders, which is the, you know, 
backpacking trip that we do outside of COVID time. And, and, and thinking about like the history of indigenous people in Williamstown informs uh, the way I give that presentation. And I think, you know, were I to give it again, I would give the presentation in a different way. So it, I think that uh, having this role that I've been fortunate to have, um, it allows me to reflect on my own position and reflect on the ways that I engage in the Williams community and um, helps me facilitate things for others and how they engage with our community. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Mohammed, I wonder if you would like to share some comments about the work you've done through the Davis Center and some of the ways in which um, it has, uh, some of those projects have been exciting and engaging for you. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll spend a bit of time talking about that and I'll also uh, just quickly respond to, to two of the questions which um, were asked. So I served on the board of the Black Student Union, uh, was the freshman year rep my first year at Williams. Um, I was also chair of the Muslim Student Union. I spent some time uh, working with um, VP Haynes and uh, the Office of Institutional Diversity and Equity. And so similar to, to Dominic, I've, I've worn a, many different hats. Uh, I think one of the important responsibilities that the Davis Center uh, has had over the last few years is especially in transitioning students between high school and getting to Williams. So that comes on the front of academics, something that you know starts with leadership in the Davis Center, then down to individual clubs that are say a part of Minco, like study groups, student organizations that are focused on ensuring that any sort of gaps in information and in knowledge and skills and practices that will guarantee student success are met. But also just in terms of uh, opportunity and also adjusting to the social environment. Uh, as was laid out at the beginning of this, Williams is an incredibly diverse place. The organizations that I've been a part of have also been incredibly diverse. Um, and it's, it's difficult to make a space really meaningful as a home if you just sort of walk in expecting everyone to be on a level playing field in terms of traditions, in terms of uh, anything from, it could, you know, it could be anything from like as simple as an icebreaker um, to the planning and hosting of an event. And so I think that having those sensibilities naturally makes planning difficult. Uh, it makes club membership and retention difficult, um, but it also makes it difficult to plan an experience that you can walk away from and say, this was exciting for everyone who was involved. And I think that's where the Davis Center really comes into play uh, and, and, and provides students with, with this sort of like a, a mini arsenal of resources to be able to make events really fun, really enjoyable. And I think we've seen that for students that uh, especially are, are on campus, but also remote during the pandemic, uh, even during Black History Month. Uh, somehow this is feels like it's been the most exciting Black History Month in Davis Center history. There's like always something going on. Um, we've still been able to engage with, with food and movies and events and history and, 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 and talks from uh, all of these different things, even though we aren't able to gather. And so uh, just to end on this first part, is, as Don pointing out, I, I think that's why the, the this sort of new Davis Center is so poignant and so important. I think that is going to be the bridge that allows for the Davis Center to fulfill its, fulfill its mission to advance uh, sort of the broader Williams community on issues of identity, history, cultures, um, and, and how they impact our lives. And so I think that it's important there. And it's great that students were there from the very beginning of the process. Like I was in meetings helping decide who like the architects and developers were gonna be. Um, I really have no experience with that stuff, but they thought that the, that the student viewpoint was important. And so um, secondly, there, there were two questions in the chat. One, of, one was about sort of coming to, to future peace with the Williams experience and also personally for me, which is related, a question about how the college has reached out and interacted with um, programs in the community. Um, so I, I think as a student, that's something that I have tried to do a lot while at Williams. Um, and I think this is a, a perfect example of um, new ways for the Davis Center to sort of grow in its ability um, to overcome just some of the hurdles because of where we are of getting engaged with that work. A perfect example of a hurdle is transportation. Um, you know, Berkshire County, for instance, is a lot of sort of, especially Northern Berkshire County, is a lot of like small communities and small towns. 
and it's difficult to get around. You know, not everyone has a car and, and not everyone is able to go out and find out and access different resources um, and things like that, uh, it, you know, sh you know, have been and will continue to be a part of the vision of the role that the Davis Center plays, not just here and being on campus, but Williamstown as a whole in Northern Berkshire County. Um, me personally, for instance, I, I started the uh, Berkshire County uh, Court Watch program, which essentially is an army of trained volunteers across the county who uh, go and ob observe disparities in prosecutions. And we've been working really closely with the local DA's office to really limit the use of cash bail. Um, hopefully, at some point, we'll be able to actually officially end it. Um, but that's something that actually came from an opportunity of a, a Sentinels Fellowship, which was through CLIA but was originally supported by members of the Davis Center who allowed for me to um, access community resources and figure out the best way to set up such a program. Um, perhaps most topical right now is uh, last summer, Williamstown's uh, select board, which is sort of like the local government established um, the Williamstown Committee on Diversity, Inclusion and Racial Equity. And so uh, looking at all of those different issues, covering things from policing, racial justice, affordable housing, aging. Um, so I'm the chair of that committee. Um, and that's something, uh, I'm actually not really sure how that happened. Um, I did, it, it wasn't something that I, that I, that I planned uh, to, to, to come true, but um, what it's allowed for me to do is to even further figure out ways to leverage great institution in a great place in a great place that has a lot of issues, a lot of problems um, that don't exclude it from national conversations that we're having. Um, and so in terms of right now, the the, the Davis Center is 100% all in and, you know, where is an opportunity for us to, to, to further our entry into the community and to, and to make an impact and into the future, how do we make that perspective um, really an important part that defines the identity of the Davis Center and any Williams student that that passes through. What a fantastic answer. And, and you did the wonderful thing of bridging to the questions that have started to come into the chat, which uh, is perfect timing because we were we were gonna head in that direction. So um, I, I really love how you've opened the door to a couple of the questions that came in. So um, you, you've started a conversation about engaging with the community. Um, I wonder if anyone else on the panel would like to add anything to uh, some of your uh, thoughtful comments about student engagement or other engagement with the community that the Davis Center is fostering. Maybe just go ahead, Eden Renee. So I, when we can't make an event open to the public, um, so we do on Thursday, I uh, have a talk back for um, Miss Juneteenth, uh, which is uh, in the one of the movies that we're doing as part of Black History Month as, as well as part of, part of the uh, Social Change film series. So that talk back is open to the public and will be advertised um, to, to the local community as well to be able to, to attend and uh, talk with uh, DC staff as well as um, one of our, one of the students and to, and to engage. Um, and, but we also have, a, 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 I guess it's, an, it's like a good way to call it would be an internship, um, but basically there is um, the, the DEI committee within Williamstown wanted to learn more about what's going on in terms of other responses to how it is that we can um, respond differently whenever there's a call to the police. Uh, and that not every single thing that is a 911 call is actually something that a police officer would be the best person, best suited um, to be able to, to address. So the uh, they're turning to social workers to try to learn more. Um, so we have a connection with, um, you know, uh, uh, one of our community engagement fellows will be working with that to, to do more research as to what other um, parameters could be thought of, what other ways could be thought of in going further to, to try to produce that report by the end of the semester to, to figure out how is it that we can um, be thinking about things differently and specifically like we're talking about in terms of how social workers can can help. Thanks. So those, are, those are just a couple things. And I can just say too quickly that the education and workshop piece is a huge one. I mean, we are, we engage uh, local educational institutions all the time, you know, weekly, every other week, um, and partner with them to try to help meet their needs. 
And the same, the same is true with regard to law enforcement, not, not only in Williamstown, but also in broader Berkshire County in particular. So we are routinely called on to engage with the chiefs of police across the county to uh, talk about and advise on issues of diversity, equity, inclusion. We have provided workshops to Williamstown um, Police Department as well, so that all of their, their staff has, has engaged us. And we continue to do that work now. Um, you may have seen in one of Maud's correspond communications out that we are working on an MOU right now with the town of Williamstown to help highlight some of the values that we both share and, and uh, it will be centered on guiding principles and then of course get into the weeds with regard to how we hope to engage the different members of our community. So I just wanna throw that in. Thanks so much. Um, so there are lots of questions uh, that are coming through in the chat. I'd like to um, begin to move into some of the other ones. There is one question that, um, that I always love, so I'm gonna throw it out. People often ask me, which is how can uh, alumni help with the work of the college in different ways? Um, this question, of course, is focused on the Davis Center and what ways can alumni be supportive uh, of the work and be helpful? Um, and uh, maybe Letitia, I'll start directing that to you by directing that one to you. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so can I, I'm going to partially answer that question and another one at the same time. There was a question about um, how we are honoring Allison Davis and um, reflecting on the lives of the Davises. So let me just say this, we, we routinely celebrate and honor um, not only the Davises, but other alums as well, alums of color as well. Um, recently, Clinton Williams, who directs special academic programs, hosted a birthday party, a virtual birthday party for Alan, Allison Davis. Um, several members of his family were um, attended that, as well as the Allison Davis Research Fellows who are currently um, in their term, and the Mellon Mays Fellows who are currently in their term, as well as several alums. The alum piece was so powerful. I mean, to see so many alums on the screen and support telling their own stories and sharing their experiences, um, not only on campus at Williams, but afterwards was so empowering. I think for our students, I know for our students because our students said just as much. And when I, and there's another question that came in about um, pathways. So the, those programs, the research fellowships, the opportunities, the internships through the Davis Center, through special academic programs, those are the things we're taught, we talk about when we talk about pathways to and through the academy. Things that students can take advantage of that they might not have otherwise known about. Um, and so we do, we do a lot around that. And Maude, if I'm not answering your first question, let me know. But, but my point is that students really appreciate seeing alums and the success that they have, how they're able to do this. So when I talked about the fellows, many of them are interested in graduate school. As you can imagine right now during this COVID pandemic, many graduate schools have put a, put a pause on their admission cycles and are not doing it. So just having people there saying, you can do this, here are some ideas of what you might do in the interim. If you're not going to go to graduate school, pursue a doctorate right after, after a Williams. Um, so having that engagement and, you know, allowing us to call on you for that engagement is what I think is most powerful and meaningful. Um, and we, I just want to say thank you because many of you, I, I'm looking at the list of people on the call and many of you have um, allowed us to do that. Yeah, I wonder if the uh, either of the students um, on the panel could speak to engagement with alumni. I don't know if you've had the chance to do that as part of your time here. But Dom, I see you shaking your head. Maybe you could just say something about what that has meant to you or how you've how you've um, engaged with alumni. Sure. Um, so pre-COVID, uh, the Davis Center used to do trips to different cities on the East Coast, and and one of those trips we actually got to meet uh, members of the Davis family, and they talked about. Uh, their experience um, in Williamstown and the kind of groundbreaking work and just journey that Allison, da Allison Davis uh, went on. Uh, during that same trip, we also met uh, alums of color all over the New York City area. And it was really meaningful and um, just really incredible to see all the different pathways that people have gone on from, uh, from media work to government work. And it was, you know, it was very cool for each of us to kind of find different mentors in different areas during that time. Thank you so much. Mohammed, do you want to say something? Yeah, uh, I, I would just say there, there are, you know, a lot of different ways that Williams actually facilitates interacting with alumni. So, you know, events like bowling weekend, um, there, there are tons of events like that, that, you know, usually sort of traditionally happen at Williams 
Um, but there's also some informal means that just come about through, for instance, uh, smaller student organizations, especially under the Minco branch. And so uh, it's really easy to meet younger alums that way, but also some older alums who uh, sort of are, you know, on a list of alumni that are, say, working in a certain field or living in a certain place as a resource to reach out to. So, um, for instance, when I you know, I was interning across the country in a state that I'd never been in before. Um, you know, there was a list of alum, many of who had actually led Minco clubs. Um, some of that that I was a part of, and some that I wasn't, uh, were like, "Hey, yeah, here's all the information you need to know. You know, here's my number. Here's how we can connect." Um, and so there are different ways that 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 you know usually plays out. Um, and of course, always sort of ways to improve it by making it more accessible, easier for students to get their hands on, more updated, things of that sort. Um, but it is something that uh, the, the college and students actively work to achieve. Thank you so much. Um, there's a question uh, in the chat about um, the college's engagement um, with Native American students uh, and what kind of partnership uh, the Davis Center has offered in that space. Um, and, uh, and I maybe um, Eden, Renee, and Letitia can speak to it. Before doing that, I, I, I would just um, like to note that this has been um, a topic of pretty significant conversation at the college since I arrived um, and symbolized, I hope, in a very positive steps with the establishment of a relationship between us and the Stockbridge Muncie tribe, uh, which included um, bringing uh, representatives from their um, office of historical research, I don't have the name exactly right, but uh, which is on now housed in college property on Spring Street um, and has allowed us to develop a series of partnerships um, with them uh, and, and uh, particularly exciting to me, student internships um, for folks uh, who have spent um, part in this last January winter session, but also um, going forward, uh, doing work um, with the tribe on um, historical research. And that, that has really been, I think, a very exciting opportunity. Um, I wonder if uh, other panelists um, would like to, to say anything about that work or some of the other uh, um, work that's going on in, in indigenous history and um, partnerships with the Davis Center. I'll say one thing and then I don't know if Carden, Carmen, even Renee wanna jump in, but what I was going to say is that um, with regard to what Maud mentioned about engaging the Stockbridge Muncie community, they have, I mean, we have been working with them in some ways for some time now and having them here has really um, meant a great deal to our community and students in particular, shortly after they um, moved into the space on Spring Street, so to speak, they really started to engage members of our community. And we have now racial justice fellowships that several students have been able to take advantage of. Um, and the Davis Center, the broader off office, special academic programs, the Career Center, um, CLIA are all really partnering um, with the Davis Center kind of being a hub of helping to facilitate these relationships and these um, externships, internships, fellowships, you, you name it. Um, and so that's one thing. And I don't know if Eden Renee or Carmen wanted to mention anything about that because several, th th we just got an email, Maud and I were on an email chain uh, literally the other day from a member of the community, Stockbridge Muncie community, um, thanking us for supporting the students and saying they've had a fantastic experience. And then I just was on an email with Eden Renee um, and Clinton Williams asking, saying they wanted to engage more this, this semester and over the summer. Uh, so I don't know if anything anyone wants to mention anything else about those fellowships, but I, mean, I can just too much. go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, Mohammed. Go ahead. Oh yeah, I was just gonna gonna speak uh, generally. Uh, so uh, the the committee that that Williamstown formed has been engaging them as well in the college a lot on on the issue, um, and so Heather Brugel, who is their director of cultural affairs. Um, also, just for background context, the, the Stockbridge Muncie uh, community of Mohican Indians formerly resided in what is now Williamstown, now I'm based in Wisconsin. Um, so Heather Brugel, who is their director of, of cultural affairs, uh, has been engaging a lot with the college and with the local Williamstown committee on ways to just increase the relationship and improve things. Um, there have been a lot of different ideas and thoughts and planning from cultural events to actually having members of the Stockbridge community um, come to Williamstown, their historical lands. Um, and obviously some of that has been slowed down by COVID, but uh, I just wanted to make a note of that. So, and there's also an extension office now, which 
uh, the Williamstown sort of helped in the establishment of that's based here uh, for, for them to be able to work out of. Thank you so much. Um, changing directions a little bit, there's a, an interesting question for the students in the chat, which is um, focused on the balance in your lives between academic and co-curricular experiences on the college. Um, and the, the questioner notes that um, during her time at Williams as a student and staff member, it often felt like minoritized students felt burnt out uh, due to a lack of balance that was particularly heavy um, in those communities. So um, the questioner is asking if that's changed or how you've experienced that. So uh, Mohammed, since you're still right up in front on my screen, do you wanna take a, a first stab at that one? Sure, um, you know, I have my days <laughs> um, a, a, as we all do, but I think once again, um, it's topical that we're discussing the Davis Center because, uh, but for its existence, um, I would have many more of those days that, uh, that I think would have derailed and, you know, some of that balance and would have made me feel like I, I would have had to um, neglect things that I would have really enjoyed doing um, beyond curricular uh, responsibilities. So I think a lot of it is rooted in how are student clubs designed to support students, be it academics, be it um, emotionally, especially mental health, um, and making sure that they have the skills to, to, to succeed, but also the confidence to um, sometimes say, look, I may have to change uh, the proportion of this that I do to be able to prioritize something else. Um, and I think that that's something that once again trickles down from the leadership of the Davis Center and having the resources to be able to, to provide students with that optionality. Wonderful, thank you. Dom, how about you? Yeah, I would 100% agree. I mean, I would say that I think a lot of Williams students come to Williams sort of being president of five clubs. <laughs> They're already moving around a lot, but I think that the Williams culture broadly kind of encourages you to stop and say, wait, why am I, why are you doing all these things? And, and many of my mentors at the DC have been those people for me and kind of said like, hold on a minute. <laughs> uh, maybe you want to do one thing at a time. Um, so I, I don't, I, I personally have found that uh, Williams and the Davis Center in particular has been kind of a a stabilizing force for a lot of people. And um, yeah, I haven't, I, you know, as all people do, I've had to figure out how to balance things, but I think um, a lot of the DEI work has, that the college does encourages more of a balance for students. I'm so glad to hear that. That's very good to hear. Carmen, I wonder if you wanted to weigh in on this topic a little bit, because you guide and advise so many students. And um, so I know from a, a kind of a bird's eye view, you have a perspective on what this experience has been like for them. And I should say for faculty too, because I think one of the things we hear a lot about is the sort of uneven in ways advising students can fall on um, particularly faculty and faculty of um, uh, particular identities. And that often means folks who are also younger just in terms of um, sort of who the college has hired and in, in what order. So I wonder if you wanted to talk a little bit about that, Carmen, from your perspective. Sure, I mean, <laughs> I'll just say our students are amazing. Uh, they take leadership often um, and do a really great job with it. And I do think that what I see the Davis Center offering is support. Um, hopefully communicating that you're never alone in the work. And if you are, something's got to give. Um, because if the work is not fundamentally about grassroots organizing and community building and networking, um, something is amiss, right? Um, and so I think we try to communicate that, um, that hopefully you don't feel like you're in it alone, um, that there is staff. If something gets too much, too hard, or beyond the scope of what a student should be having to confront, that is what the Davis Center staff is here for, right? Um, to pick up certain pieces or to help support even more um, when certain things might need to be addressed. And I think the other thing, and this is always challenging, is it's, it's the long haul, right? It's about balance in the day um, and in the semester. 
um, where you hope to end up with those grades that you need to move forward with at the same time that you know you're doing a bunch of important work, but you don't want to burn out because the work doesn't end right and so strategizing about like you all like you were both saying right what you can do right now what you might need to pause on a little bit and let somebody else carry for a while or carry a little bit more for a while so that you can enter back in full steam. Um, and this is not surprisingly very much of the same conversation that one has with uh, especially pre-tenure faculty, right? Um, you know, because these are, <laughs> this is life, right? Um, you know, and we, we don't have the luxury of burning out and we don't have the luxury of um, working ourselves to exhaustion because we have to keep going. Um, the issues don't go away, the work doesn't go away. Um, and so, um, you know, we can, we can take breaks, we can reshift, we can balance differently, um, but we need to be able to keep going and to support each other and in, 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 in always going forward. Um, and that just has to look like different things at different times. It just does, and it should, and that's okay. Um, but these are never ending conversations. And I will say, I don't think it makes it any easier. So I'm glad to hear that students are feeling some support around this. Um, because especially with the summer that we've seen and with trying to figure out how to do this through COVID, we are all exhausted, right? But again, we're, but we're in it together um, and we're trying to always build that out so that there is, is more of that kind of support for, you know, for each other and for ourselves as well. So um, it's, it's actually a remarkably similar conversation. I will say um, that faculty need the Davis Center staff too. Um, we need the affinity groups, we need the community engagement fellows. Um, you know, I started in 2001. It was a very different faculty demographically. It was pretty lonely, <laughs> I'll just say, you know, sometimes. Um, and you did carry a lot of the advising work. And so having um, the Davis Center thrive, um, I've always said as a professor, the Davis Center is how lots of my students have gotten through. Right, it isn't just me, it isn't just what I can do in the classroom or even as an advisor and a mentor to my students. Um, you know, it, ta it takes a community and it, it takes that kind of support. And so the Davis Center is really critical um, to enabling the faculty to do the mentoring and advising work that they do as well and still manage to do the scholarship and the teaching and the curriculum development and all the other things that they have to do, especially as pre-tenure faculty. I, I really appreciate and I know we're coming uh, up on our time and there are questions we've, as is always the case, that um, we haven't gotten to. Um, there's not one, there's one asking for a future uh, uh, conversation to talk about sort of our metrics for success and how we'll know when we get there. And I, I think I might end by noting that um, part of answering that question is also, I think, an, an beginning to be an answer to some of the other questions in the chat, which is how do we, we acknowledge the times where we don't hit our goal, where students or faculty or staff don't feel fully included in the community. And um, I'm, I'm, Letitia and I have talked a lot about the ongoing nature of the work, the way in which um, it is important to acknowledge that as we continue to work on and think about how we can continue to make the college be um, inclusive going forward uh, in ways that um, will increasingly um, make this experience be um, a successful and supportive one for everyone who's here. We use the word thrive a lot. We want folks in our community to thrive. Uh, and the Davis Center, it has been historically very very important in that role. And um, I think this initiative seeks to um, acknowledge its centrality in supporting um, folks along the way and, uh, and really um, increase its significance on the campus uh, by investing in it um, for the, for the long, longer term. And so um, I, I, I should say in my role, um, I'm exceptionally grateful to not only the people here, uh, who I am very grateful to the people here, of course, uh, but also uh, to the ways in which they um, represent uh, the larger, um, Williams community. Uh, the, the, we are a collaborative community, um, but the David Center in particular uh, is a highly collaborative space. Um, and I think uh, the comments about um, engaging students in the building project just I think points to the ways in which we actively seek to do that work uh, and to be um, as uh, in, uh, engaging the wider community here as we can. So. Um, I really want to thank uh, Leticia and Eden Renee and Carmen and Mohammed and Dominic for joining us today. Um, and I just 
want to emphasize that it is really through the collective institutional support um, that we will continue to make investments in the people and programs um, and that will make sure that we can ensure that the David Center, Davis Center will continue to work to build an inclusive community for students, faculty, and staff to make sure that they're equally seen, heard, uh, and respected and feel at home. Um, but also, as you've heard, to be advocates and allies for social justice on campus and in our region, uh, in the community, and around the world. Um, to build and support pathways to and through um, the academy so that talented students from all backgrounds can maximize their potential because of course we're um, very interested in their experiences here but we're also deeply committed to the impact that they can have in the world uh, and of course to educate students from all backgrounds and prepare them to be successful in any field or industry as they go forward uh, so with that, I really want to thank our alumni support uh, out there in the community um, for all you do. Um, it's wonderful to have you here. We look forward to really having you here. We, 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 miss, the, we miss our three-dimensionality, and we look forward to seeing you all here soon. Um, and thanks again to the wonderful team here for all you're doing every day to make Williams a, a wonderful place for our students, faculty, uh, and staff. So thank you, everybody. Great to see you.